Hey everybody, welcome to this very special episode of The Squad Room. I make that sound like an after school special, but in a lot of ways it is. This uh, is an episode that's actually not about me. It's about my sometimes uh, occasional uh, co-host, Traver. Traver Bone has been my partner in this project in many ways, and he's been my coach in the gym uh, for the last, well, since we started this project back in April and May. When I came uh, to Traver with this idea, he jumped on board and wanted to be part of it, and he is the co-owner of CrossFit Pacific Coast and Gravitas Performance Labs, and uh, that's the gym I go to here in town. And um, he agreed to take me under his wing as a private uh, client, and he provided me with all the physical fitness training programming that I did over the last 10 months. Now, when this program started, or when the squad room started, Trevor was going through something that I uh, would hope none of us ever have to go through, but I know that a lot of us have gone through, and um, that is something he'll talk about in this episode coming up. And one of the things that came out during um, those early conversations after we started this project together was um, the, the position or the spot that he was in in life, which was bad. And unbeknownst to me, um, he was going through a lot of hard stuff and he was dealing with a lot of hard stuff that I had no idea was occurring uh, at the time. And um, how he dealt with it throughout the year and watching him deal with it over the last year has been pretty amazing. And he's going to talk about that today because it really is going to inform, well, what he's doing for the next year. But it's informed his approach to the last, uh, to a lot of this, a lot of the information he's given out in the last couple, in the episodes he's been on has uh, been framed through this, uh, this issue, these issues that he's dealing with, uh, essentially um, his own, his own struggles. And I find this interesting um, to bring up. And the reason I'm recording something before I just launch into it and we just start going is I want you to keep an open mind. And um, Traver uh, is a very inspirational guy. He's a very smart guy, world traveled and, and very uh, knowledgeable about the human condition and here's a guy that um, this year has has had the human condition come crashing down on him, and he's going to go out next year and explore it even further. But one of the things that in recording this episode um, I was concerned about was that Traver speaks very honestly and very openly about um, where he was at in life when he when we started this project and the, what was going on with him at the time. And what he had to do to kind of um, really build, uh, build, a, build again and start, start over. So he's very honest. And um, this being an ep- uh, a podcast for cops who are um, can be sometimes judgmental and uh, critical and those kinds of things. I just want to emphasize that you keep an open mind because he does talk about some of his own uh, addictions that are counterintuitive to somebody who is in such great physical shape. But I think it's telling that um, it, it keeps bringing up this point that I, that I make over and over again that we all need a coach. We all need people to turn to, whether you call them mentors or whatever. But um, Trevor's no different than I am in that sense and that he certainly coached me through many things over the last year. Uh, but we also developed a good um, friendship through these other issues that he was uh, struggling with. And um, he'll talk about them here. So uh, I don't want to give anything away because it's a great episode and it's super powerful. But um, you will, if you've been listening to these shows for a while, you will have a bit of a disconnect with um, some of the things you've heard before. And I think that's actually a good thing in some ways. Um, and uh, and uh, it's 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 pretty moving to watch someone go through what he went through and to take the approach he took, which I don't think I could have done, uh, to face all your demons and all your fears and all of your frustrations all at once and uh, with a extremely clear mind. Anyway, on to today's episode. Would love your uh, thoughts and opinions on it. Reach out to us on Twitter and Instagram at the Squad Room or shoot me an email at thesquadroom.com. Uh, if you've got uh, if you've got some comments or some insights, we'd love to hear them. All right, here's the episode.
Hey everybody, welcome back to episode 23 of The Squad Room. I'm your host, Garrett Tesla. I'm an active duty police sergeant, sheriff sergeant specifically, for Sheriff's Department in Southern California. The Squad Room is a podcast devoted to optimizing the health and wellness of police officers and other first responders all around the world. I say police officers a lot of times, but I should be more open to the fact that we do actually have some firefighters and some paramedics that listen to the show too. So I don't mean just physical health and exercise, but to how to maintain our mental health, our wellness, our mindfulness, all the things that can make us uh, better at our jobs, better at our home lives, better with our kids, uh, all those things. Uh, we have a great and very special episode, like an after-school special, a very special <laughs> episode of the Squad Room today. <laughs> that laugh is Traver Bohm. Hello. Welcome back. Thank you. Um, before we get started on talking about all the goodness that we're going to talk about today, I want to do a couple things. I want to remind people that you can join our mailing list by texting the squad room to 44222 and you can get signed up right there from your phone. I don't track your phone number and I don't spam you or anything like that. Don't worry about that. I don't even have your phone number. It just is a device to send uh, send you some information. And also want to thank our sponsors for the show, SB Tactical and the iCombat Active Shooter Training System. I know you've heard me talk about iCombat before, but it's pretty cool, so you're going to hear me talk about it again. Uh, it's a replication system, not a simulation system, for active shooter training for law enforcement. Basically, what you do is you get outfitted with a replica Glock 17, and uh, you can also get repli- uh, replica AR-15s. And um, you wear a vest, and you have this vest, and um, it's, it's basically well, it's basically laser, ta- laser tag for adults. Trevor, have you ever seen the system? I know you know the guys from yeah. SP Tactical. Have, you sh- have they shown it to you? I have not seen it. It's pretty cool because uh, I've used it at my department. Yeah, long before I was uh, doing this podcast or that they sponsored the show and just thought it was really cool. Um, you wear a tack vest that out, that fits over uh, any other tack vest you might have on or bulletproof vest or anything like that. So you can wear your, you, you can wear your uniform, whatever it is, whether you're a SWAT uniform, a gang uniform, or a patrol uniform like I have. Um, and it registers the shots from these firearms. And these Glocks and these ARs that they have cycle like real guns and they have ammo accountability oh, and they're wow. weighted so they feel like a real gun like it sounds you, fun as hell it is fun <laughs> yeah. like i say it's laser yeah. tag for adults yeah um it's adult because there's also a shock belt you wear that oh, if wow. you get hit you get, a, <laughs> you get a little juice okay what i like about that though is that it does uh it trains and not well not, it trains you but it also will show you um what your natural fight or flight instinct is when you get that shock uh, which is to simulate of course being shot right. what you do right do you power through it and do you keep moving or do you collapse into a ball of goo on the floor right and i've seen both of those happen oh wow. when someone gets shot with this and they just totally lose their oodle loop and they lose their decision making capability and they get so stressed out even though it's a sim it's a simulation yeah. system or a replication system and um it replicates the idea of being shot just the fact that it's a it's it's something new and a little pain induction, it right. totally throws them for a loop. Oh, that's so it's a very good learning experience for that. Yeah. You learn a lot about um, what you're going to do when you react, you know, and how you react. We did this inside of a big old warehouse, mm. and it was uh, it was crazy. They had, like, smoke machines going and, oh, wow. like, rock music playing, and they were simulating an active shooter, and they were throwing flashbangs as we went through. <laughs> so it's so, so it was fun. Like, <laughs> it was real. I mean, yeah. it was very real. And, um, uh it's a great system. Anyway, um, Boston SWAT used it during Urban Shield. LAPD just fielded it for their uh, in-service training for their active shooter units. It's really cool. So you can check it out at sptactical.com. It's called the iCombat Training System. And uh, they're uh, they're good dudes. They're veterans. That's awesome. And yeah. they're American-owned and made. So that's yep. even more awesomer. So, yeah, good awesomer. people. There's another word. So, yeah, good people. Check them out, sptactical.com. And we uh, thank them for their support of the show. They have been huge. Yeah. Huge supporters of what we're trying to accomplish here, uh, and uh, and they're fantastic. All right, so Traver, welcome back. You were here for episode Thank you. twenty-two. I was. We were in the uh, what we were calling the amateur recording studio, <laughs> which is my kitchen. We're back. The professional recording studio is my garage. The amateur recording studio is my kitchen, and um, we're here today. Well, specifically, we're in the kitchen because my wife's gone, so we yep, got permission yep. to be in the house. Yeah, we're living the dream. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> It might explain yep. <laughs> to you why it's echoey. It sounds a little different too, but it's cold outside, so we're going to come inside where it's warm. Um, this episode is not about me. Mm. And we get to turn the tables a little bit. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited. <laughs> you should be. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm excited because I get to interview you a little bit. That's right. And we're going to do it uh, a little differently. And you've got a project coming up 
that is going to encompass your. We just talked about 2016, my 2016. Yeah. But now we're going to talk about yours. Yeah. Because yours is going to be pretty unique. Yeah. It started already. It started already. So let's uh, let's back up to for for everyone listening. Sure. You are. Well, I guess were I was uh, a co-owner, co-founder of CrossFit Pacific Coast. Yes. Um, and then, of course, what you, also later you built uh, Gravitas Performance Labs. Yes. Which are this are this owned by the same you and Eric. Our, yep. Eric Mazzone, a guest on episode four. They share a common wall, mm-hmm. but it was an idea of CrossFit training yep. and then private training. Yep. Um, and not just private training, but I mean like private coaching, really, yep. like really Distance in training. depth, yeah, get in kind there. of different coaching. So you go into one room for the co- the CrossFit style classroom stuff. The other room you go into for the real dialed in personal stuff is what, which is what we've been doing for the last year. Right, is that one on one? Here's your program specific for you for the week for your goals, and uh, and we could and we were doing that. Yep. Um, we. People have, can listen to other episodes to hear your your history before that, or some right. of it. But I want to bring up some of it here. Sure. But, um, however, it was you ended up here in Santa Barbara in January. You were here. I was here. <laughs> and then uh, you had a huge shift in yes. January. Yeah. Tell us about that. Okay. Uh, most of you know, if, even throughout these episodes, I had said something happened in my life in January, and uh, this was January of 2015. And I'll back up a little bit because I think it started um, bef- just prior to that. I was married and my wife and I had a miscarriage. And I think that threw our marriage into a little bit of a challenge. I didn't know that. Yeah. Each of us handled it poorly, I would say. Um, poorly may be a little bit of a judgmental word, but I handled it by dissociating from it, by drinking it, by getting, I smoked a lot of pot through it. I worked myself too much for it and uh my ex-wife uh she handled it in her own way and that led us to have some tough times which i thought we were then coming out of towards the later part of 2014 and 2014 christmas we had a great holiday together we had a great new year's we celebrated um, our third legal wedding anniversary and you know toasted on new year's here's to forever and then i woke up about a week later And I could tell something was bothering her, even though we had spent the morning in bed together. And I went and made breakfast and just asked the question. This is the, for all you married guys, never ask this question. This is, this is the lesson of the episode. I asked, uh, is something bothering you? And Garrett, I I can see it as clearly as I can see you. She looked right across the table from me and said, I'm sorry, I can't be married to you any longer. I'm packing a bag and I'll be gone within the hour. Ooh. Yeah. I actually threw up uh, when she told me that. I first asked if she was kidding, and she said, no, um, I think I've had enough, and I need to go away for a while. And she left. And that started a cascade of events leading me to where I am right now, but more change than I knew how to handle. More change than I think most people know how to handle when the rug gets ripped out from under you. Mm -hmm. Um, So I quickly decided I couldn't stay in my house. And so I moved in with Eric, my business partner, and he and I started having a lot of heart to hearts. And he brought up the fact that for years I had been struggling in our business with wanting to do other stuff. I'd want to write a book. I'd wanted to give speeches. I was, I had another company at one point. I was teaching self-defense. I was doing a lot of non CrossFit gym ownership stuff Mm -hmm. and loved it. And he said, you know, while you're having, while everything's changing, ask yourself if this is what you still want to do. And it was a great question because I loved teaching CrossFit. I loved coaching it. I loved working with people like you and working with the athletes, but running a gym wasn't my calling and I knew it. And so I said, okay, while this is, while I'm going through hell, let's just throw all the change in together and figure out if there's something else I can be doing. That is my highest form of expression and really who I am and encompasses all of these sort of weird idiosyncrasies I have, these weird talents I have, and these weird interests I have. So uh, just for accountability, we'll throw it in there. Um, I also at the time, as soon as my wife left, I knew that if I, if I was drinking through it or smoking pot through it or dissociating in any way, I was going to end up right back where I was 
a couple years later. So I decided to get completely sober and haven't had a drink since, haven't smoked since. I'm coming up on my year anniversary this Friday of uh, not having any substances. And it was important to me because the work I did, I helped people get, get off alcohol, stop drinking. I help help people get off drugs. Um, and so in full disclosure, there were a lot of times through the last couple of years where I felt like that Republican senator in the airport bathroom with his <laughs> legs too wide who had just voted on the anti-gay you know, yeah. propositions, but yet it was doing some shady shit. So I wanted to live with complete integrity and uh, not feeling like I had a double life. I would have a meeting with someone on how they can eat better, how they can clean up their lives. I'd come home and have a half a bottle of, of wine and then smoke a joint so I could go to sleep. And so I got rid of it all. And so this massive change agent or massive time of, of transformation. And uh, very quickly thereafter, you know, I was debating, what do I do? My, my wife had, or ex-wife had said she wasn't sure if she wanted to get divorced she just needed time, so I was in this huge limbo state. Super fair to you. Yeah, it, it is what it is. Yeah. Um, Eric had said, the door's open for you if you want to stay here and, and work in any capacity you want, but think hard, you know, because every year we sort of have the uh, he knows what he wants to do discussion, and I'm still trying to figure it out. Um, so he said, you know, you, the door's open if you want to stay. If not, you know, we'll figure something else out. And so I disappeared to Nicaragua. I was fortunate enough where he said, you know, I'll, you can still get paid, keep your um, distance clients, but get out of here. Just get the fuck out of here. And I went down there and, and for two months just fell apart. I lived in the dirt. I lived without electricity a lot, without water a lot. I surfed a lot. I meditated every single day. I journaled up, you know, I have stacks of journals that I filled out and really dove into a lot of introspection. Uh, I'll also add to this because a lot of people have asked me about it since I was on the phone with a therapist before she was out the door, literally called someone and said, Hey, I'm not going to get through this without help. And I need to go beyond my scope of skill and reached out to someone that it was a, a huge, uh, asset to me throughout the entire year. So I did get some help with this too. Um, so I was still talking to him while I was down there and trying to figure out, how do I heal myself? How do I heal my life? Because what people kept telling me even down there was, let your, let your wife go. Let the business go. And with clarity and with sincerity, figure out who the hell you are and what you want moving forward. And once you get that figured out, she and the business will, will fall into place. And I kept arguing at the time, no, 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 you know, if she wants to get back together with me, then that's, this changes X. If I go back to the business and I can make it work, it changes Y. Mm -hmm. um, but I really had to dive into what was my role in, in the marriage ending. And I did play a role in it for sure. How can I make sure that never happens again by looking at what's underneath it? So a lot of really brutal honesty and uh, how do I dive into myself and go, what do I want to do with my time? How do I want to express myself? What did I love about being a CrossFit coach that I can do next moving forward that may not in involve being a CrossFit coach or may not involve owning the business? So I came back from that, and uh, I know we're going to talk about the, the, the concept of this year. Um, I came back from that trip and still limbo, unfortunately, with with my wife at the time, Eric and I were still sort of going back and forth, but I had this idea that I had to write. I had written our daily blog for six years mm -hmm. and loved writing. When we first opened the business, I was writing for magazines, was writing for breaking muscle and uh, writing for the newspaper and loved it. Loved giving speeches. And uh, I came back and spoke with a woman who said, if you could only do one thing for the rest of your life, what would you do? I was like, Oh, God damn it. I ask this question to people all the time. <laughs> Aha! Uh, yeah. What an asshole question. Uh, and I literally blurted out, I would speak. I would be a public speaker and a writer. And she said, well, then that's what you have to do. And stop trying to fit being a public speaker and a writer into a gym owner. Let the gym go. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, my partner was gracious enough that we worked something out very favorably and that worked for him and worked for me. And, and I was able to step away from the business uh, in good graces and with our relationship still intact, which I'm grateful for. And it let me then move on to an idea. And I'll backtrack this by saying, um, since we're getting to the sort of the year project, Mm -hmm. right when my wife left, I was down at, I drove down to LA to hear a Buddhist speaker at Against the Stream Meditation Center in LA. And they had this, this program, I saw it on a flyer outside the bathroom, called the Year to Live program. I thought, huh, that's fascinating. And so I went and looked it up on their website, and it was a 12-month program that you met once a month with a group of people and followed the protocol that's written up in Stephen Levine's book, A Year to Live, as a preparation for the last year of your life. So if I were to pass away on December 31st, 2016, what would I do in that process leading up to it? Mm -hmm. A life review. There's some specifics. Life review, different meditations, uh, making amends, coming to terms with certain things, connecting with people that may have been lost, etc. I thought, wow, that'd be a really cool program, but I don't know if I'm getting divorced yet, and I'm not sure what I'm doing with the business. I'll shelf this idea. And so I came back from Nicaragua and had an idea that I wasn't going to be in the business any longer and talked to Eric about it and knew I wanted to write, knew I wanted to speak. Uh, things were still up in the air with my wife, but I said, you know what, I'm going to move forward with this idea anyway. Actually, it was still just an inception at that point. The woman who had helped me figure out speaking and writing said, hey, I want you to try to get on TED Los Angeles. I had written a a public talk on pain that I actually think we've done as an episode here. Yeah, so it'll it'll come out after this. I wanted to to do this first and then we'll do it. Sure. So I I gave that talk at the gym at, at CrossFit Pacific Coast and got a really good reception for it. She said, hey, you should take this to TED and see if they'll let you do it there. And she reached out to Ted and they said, what we're after is people that have done a social experiment. So would he be willing to take 20 people and not only run them through the concepts of this speech, but use it as, okay, on day one, your pain's at a level 10. Eight weeks later, your pain's where? And every week we've met and meditated. They've eaten a certain way. They've embraced pain in a different mentality, et cetera. Mm -hmm. They said, would you be willing to do that? I said, absolutely not. (laughs) (laughs) Because at this point, truly, uh, I'm still dealing with depression. I'm still dealing with, you know, I'm in the midst of finding out I'm getting divorced. And some days are awful and some days are amazing. And I'm also knowing I'm stepping away from my business and that's not public yet. So I'm just having to deal with all of this in a way that emotionally I'd never had to deal with anything. Uh, My life has been very good. I haven't had a lot of trauma. I'm very blessed in that way. Not a lot of people have died. My parents are still together. You know, things have been good. So I was just dealing with all of this shit happening at the same time. Yeah. And for the first time in about a decade, not dissociating from it in any way. So having to go, oh, wow, this is what feelings feel like. They're kind of shitty sometimes. (laughs) Hmm. Um, So I turned that down. But the idea then popped into my head. What if I did a 12-month social experiment, and instead of using a control group to go through pain, what if I embraced this year-to-live concept and not only lived it myself, but lived it publicly, just how you did with, with, the, uh, with, the squat, with this podcast, mm-hmm. and said, how can I use a year, because now I have this massive window that's been opened. I'm single. I'm about to turn 40 next week. I have no kids. I'm unemployed. I've got some money coming in from a payout of a business. That is a massive opening. Yeah. Those, those alignments don't happen. Those don't happen time. very often. And part of this, I'll be honest, was I didn't want to get to my 40th birthday and think, okay, no, no kid, single, unemployed, Holy shit, my life is a disaster. Right. I have failed in every capacity, every way possible a man can fail. Um, or say, oh, wow, that's a huge opening. This is a huge opportunity. Mm-hmm. Um, I, a lot of advice I got was take the money from the gym, start a new business, start dating immediately. You can be remarried within a year and a half. You can have a, you know, like 
get your life right back where it was. And I thought if I did that, I would have wasted the greatest opening of my life. Mm -hmm. I am still healthy. I am knock on wood, extraordinarily healthy and financially solvent and have the ability to literally do anything. So let's take this year and, and look back at the last 40 and say, what do I need to heal in myself? Mm -hmm. uh, I came into CrossFit as a healer. I came right out of four years of acupuncture school. And one of the reasons I love CrossFit was because I thought it was a better healing tool than needles and herbs were. Because if you could get people to move, if you could get them to eat well, mm -hmm. you could make them feel strong and feel good in their own skin. That's 90% of healing. Yeah. That's a lot better than keep living the way you're living, but once a week I'm going to stick some needles in you and hopefully magic happens. So I wanted to heal myself. One from the trauma of the divorce and that year. And two, from whatever had led me to a lifestyle that was completely out of alignment with who I am as a person, who I am as a man, and what I wanted to carry forward into the next half of my life. So let's come up with an idea. Let's take 12 months and let's, let's dive into it. And let's do some really hard stuff. One, let me look at some ways to grow, first and foremost. What's out of my comfort zone? And for me, out of my comfort zone is the non-physical, where so far I've fought in a cage. I've checked that box. I've climbed Whitney. I've checked that box. I've surfed waves that were made me want to poop in my pants. I can check that box. Run the Boston Marathon illegally. Check, check that box. Okay. You know, that sounds like a story <laughs> yeah. without registering. We'll come back Let's put to it that. that way. Yeah. Uh, a lot of, you know, division one athlete two sport. I've, I've, I've done stuff physically, but I wanted to dive into what makes me tick. Uh, how can I work with other people? Mm -hmm. How can I be of service in a massive way? How can I scare the shit out of myself on a daily basis? Because if I put parentheses around this year, and say, none of it matters. I, I can fail every day, and it doesn't matter. I'm living in my car if I want. That's okay. It's None of this matters. So let's, let's push the envelope a little bit. And so I picked some big-ticket activities that I thought would change me. And I picked some small-ticket activities that I thought would change me. And I decided to make it all public. So to blog about it every every week to shoot a video on it every day to say to the world okay how i teach garrett is that i take the things that i've effed up on and i try to explain them to other people it's like use me as an example mm -hmm. that was how i would coach like you know what i used to suck at overhead squats because i would do this and i see you're kind of sucking at overhead squats in the same way so let's work on this together mm -hmm. or these are my nutritional challenges this is where my deficiencies were uh, so to take this project and open it up to the world and say, how can we all view the processes that someone would have to go through to die in peace and apply it to people that aren't dying? Mm -hmm. So what are the things that you can do? What are the things that I can do to heal our lives that we know that we go? Yeah, I know about that. You know, just to give you an example, um, yesterday I had coffee. This was today's post on my website with my ex-girlfriend. So it's a woman I was with for five years and I reached out to her. This was years and years ago mm -hmm. and said, Hey, I, my marriage just ended and it's, it's fucking me up royally. I need someone that I have distance with, but still had the same intimacy with. Mm -hmm. And I want to know what it was like to be with me. I want to know what the hardest thing about dating me was and living with, with me was and you can be brutally honest. Like I'm taking it That's all. That's like the second question you don't want to ask your wife. Next to, yeah. Right next to is anything wrong? <laughs> the second yeah. thing is, yeah. What's the biggest problem with? Me? Yeah. Well, this you know this isn't this wasn't my wife. This was yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. But yeah. I mean, just in general. The yeah. Uh, with my wife, are... nothing was wrong. This was not my fault at all. Was it? Right. Yeah, right. I get you. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Um, so, so questions like that. Um, are you willing to sit down with someone and hear honest feedback? Ooh. And are you willing to sit down with people that you know you are disconnected from and say, I'm sorry that we're disconnected. I love you. 
and I want to heal whatever this relationship is, even if that means we walk away and never see each other again. Mm -hmm. What are the ways that we need to heal our lives? And, and how do we then take that information? How do we do it? Right. So another one that I've got coming up and I haven't done this yet is I reached out to a woman that I dated on and off as my wife came in and out of the picture of my life. And when she finally did come into my my life for good or semi for good, I guess we'll call it. Uh, I pushed the other woman away and I know that our disconnection was painful for her. So I broke it off. We have not talked in five years. And I could tell, like, when I thought of her, I thought, damn it, I was the dick. You know, mm-hmm. I acted unskillfully. I owe her an apology. And I need to reach out this year and do it, even though she's been on my mind that I knew this was coming every year since. And I did reach out to her and said, I owe you an apology. And I'd really like to do this face to face. And if that's not something that will help you, then please take this email as the apology and I'll be on my way. And the response I got from her was phenomenal that she said, you know what? I've actually written the same email to you a couple times and deleted it. I would love to sit down and, and, and just talk about what we were each going through at the time because you were a big part of my life and having this disconnection affects both of us. And so I brought this up to people and said, is there someone in your life who you could re- literally right now pick up a phone, call and say, you know what? I owe you an apology. I'm going to ask you for forgiveness. And there's not anyone that I've asked this to yet who hasn't said, yeah, uh, there's someone. <laughs> and so what I've done is slid my phone across the table and said, okay, let's call him. And the, oh, hey, 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 hey. so people then backtrack or shy away from it. But I want to do all of that stuff this year. I want to check the the hard boxes that I believe on some kind of hard to articulate, weird, esoteric level. A piece of me was with her Mm -hmm. for the last five years. I was not whole Mm -hmm. and a piece of my energy went to her. Mm -hmm. She was in my head and I want to close that loop. I want that energy back. I want that piece of myself back because my life was a, a disaster for, for lack of better term on the surface. It was great. I was married to an ex model. I lived in the house in the Hills. I had my own business where I could show up in shorts and a t-shirt. I could say fuck at work and no one yelled at me. You know, I I could do it all, but under the surface there was something that was really, there was a lot of discord. Mm -hmm. So how do I get that back into alignment? And I think part of getting that back into alignment is having these hard conversations and, asking for forgiveness and saying, I love you and reconnecting and and mending these relationships and thought patterns that, that led me to get in trouble in my marriage. So you're going to, that's a, that's a big, that's a big idea. Yeah. (laughs) Um, I'm 10 days in 10 days in already. So you're, so like you say, you're blogging about it at Mm traverbohm.com. We'll put that in the show notes and you're, you're going to be doing videos on it. Mm hmm. The year to live. So the idea is you want to mend these parts of you as if this was your last year to live. Yeah. It's, it's, there's an asterisk to it because I'm doing it in a disingenuous fashion. I'm not dying. Mm -hmm. And I think if you are, it changes the, the rules because you're prepping for that moment. You know, you're, you want to be at peace with yourself in that moment. But in the same sense, you're, you're looking at this next year as, as achieving that peace. Yeah. Just, you have the benefit of not being, uh, deceased at the end of it. Yeah. My goal is to take that peace Mm -hmm. and, and move it into the next 40, 50 years of my life. That makes perfect sense. Yeah. And inspire people along the way to say, you know what? I'm not ready to call my ex and have lunch with her. But I'll call the guy who I made fun of in high school and just apologize to him. Mm -hmm. Or I'll I'll start a meditation practice because I'm watching this guy do it Mm -hmm. and I'm seeing the benefit, et cetera. So it's been a, a, obviously, everything you just described, a big year. Yeah. And um, colossal change. Yeah. And relationships have either ended or been completely redefined. Yeah. You know, you said you fell apart in Costa Rica, or sorry, Nicaragua. Yeah. 
do you mean that like you hit you hit bottom or is that where you started to rebuild both yeah. i hit bottom mm-hmm. um i got down there and there's something very to me that place was very special mm-hmm. uh i owned property or i owned property in nicaragua and there was a tie to my ex-wife there that i went down there after she and i had spent a significant amount of time together before we were married studying for a test she and i were, were classmates And uh, I fell in love with her down there. And then I went back to this place. And here I was. The last time I was there, I was just hopeful that she and I would have a relationship. And then here I was back on the same land after, in my mind, fucking that relationship up. Mm -hmm. Um, And truthfully... I can go through through the journaling at the time. Uh, I got down there and said, what about her made me fall apart in my marriage? What about her dissociated me from my marriage? Why was it okay? What, what about her and our relationship made it okay for me to get high every day in my marriage? What about her made it okay for me to quit drinking six times in our marriage? And I'll, the asterisk I'll put by this because people are listening is I never got drunk in my marriage, maybe twice, three times, but I drank almost every day, two beers three beers. I had a 12 pack a week. And I tell that to people and they're like, Oh my God, you, that's, I've had a 12 pack on Sunday. <laughs> I'd say, yeah, but I needed to have them. Mm-hmm. And there were days that I didn't want to have them and I had them. And so something was off. You know, I've read, there's a really great book for, if this sounds familiar to any of you called no more Mr. Nice guy about male codependency. And that I believe I've fully embodied, hmm. but to get back to your question. Uh, so I get down to Nicaragua and I'm writing, it's about how is it her fault? Right, and I'm thinking this is what's going to happen. I'm surfing my brains out down there, uh, and going for the next two months. All I have to do is surf twice a day, meditate for an hour a day, and figure out why this was her fault. And then I'm going to come home, and my life's going to be amazing. And the surfing was a big part of it, and that's where my head went. And so very quickly, actually, the next day, I got injured surfing. I was actually traveling from point A to point B, had to go over a lot of sharp rocks at high tide, made a big mistake, got thrown off of those rocks by a wave, got my feet cut up, my legs, it was just awful. Uh, I was bedridden for the, next, oh, wow. for the next four days. No surfing, no doing anything. And that's when it hit. Of like, okay, you can't now hide behind this activity. And that, when I look in the journaling I did, went from how was this her fault to how was this my fault? And holy fuck, this was a lot of my fault. And not 100% blame, but I now have to take 100% responsibility for my half of it. And that's when it just hit that, damn it, there were things wrong with or challenges that I had coming into the marriage that the marriage exasperated. And there were new challenges that were created by the marriage that I didn't handle in the way I can now, but I just didn't handle well, you know, like shit, some of this was my fault Mm -hmm. and just coming to terms with that and realizing that the marriage is over period. Even though I haven't gotten paperwork, I haven't gotten, et cetera. In my head, I came to terms and I was talking to someone down there that said this, your marriage as you know, it is done. It's dead. It is. You will never go back to that woman, to that house, to that life period It's dead. And so whatever thought I had about, oh, I'll just go home and we're going to get back together and it's going to be great. I think I let go. And that's when I say I, I hit bottom. So physically, I didn't have my outlet. Still sober down there and there's not much to do. At the time, just to add a little twist from the universe, we lost power. So I'm not on the computer. I'm not listening to music. I'm just literally in a hut by myself. And we lost water. So I'm not showering. I'm just lying in bed in a hundred degree heat with my own brain, a failed marriage, a business partnership that's ending and sobriety to, to deal with. Mm -hmm. And it was a little overwhelming, but that trip was also where I put myself back together or started to put myself back together. But first I had to get to that. Do I want to die today? Thought, do Mm -hmm. I really? And okay, maybe I do. Okay, let's think this out. How do I do it? Okay, I have surf leashes. I can hang myself. All right, fuck it. You know what? Let's surf 
you know, at the end of this, let's get to the end of this two hours of surfing. If you still want to do it, I'm on board. And fortunately I went and surfed uh, on the fifth day and my head cleared up and I decided to go the other direction, but I got to that point, you know, where it wasn't a metaphysical, do I want to die? It was okay. I know the tree I'll do it from. And, uh, that was bottom, like bottom, bottom. Yeah. That, that would be bottom for anybody. Yeah. But as is often prescribed and as we've talked about, you don't, you can't, you got to know your A point. Mm-hmm. And we, you taught, you told me that on episode one or two mm-hmm. that we talked about mm-hmm. shortly, shortly after this. Mm-hmm. Um, and it strikes me now in hindsight, how, how, uh, how much you knew about that personally, mm-hmm. you know, I, I didn't know all of this. I, I knew some, yeah, you'd shared some. Yeah. Of this with me at the time and you shared more as we went but you sometimes take a coach's uh, platitudes for lack of a better term mm-hmm. as those of a coach mm-hmm. but knowing that you knew exactly you were you were just a couple of months ahead of me on some of this yeah and we're and in a lot of ways were uh were were leading the leading the way but not from very far ahead right you know you were the recon team but you were you were still out there yeah fighting that fight fight and oftentimes over the last 10 11 well, almost a year over the last year it's been a you've given me a lesson that you yourself just confirmed right only weeks prior yeah. which to me i've enjoyed good um and it's easier and it's much more authentic from the coach's perspective, uh, when you have that, when you know it's something you've actually are, are going through and dealing with. Right. Yeah. Um, I'm interested in how, um, you know, you talk about sobriety, and, mm-hmm. but the fact that you haven't, that you, you know, you, that you can count on a couple of fingers, how many times you were actually drunk, right. Like intoxicated, but that you had this, uh, this kind of this need to have something like that yeah. around to dissociate. Which I totally get. Yeah. And I think a lot of us get. Oh yeah. You know, it's like yeah, I don't I mean I don't I don't have a drinking problem. I don't get I don't get drunk every night. I don't I don't drink at right. work. I don't Right. You know, do those things. Right. But I think the word sober scares people too. Yeah. Not not from a guy I'm I'm alone with my thoughts way, but um you know, the idea that to be sober that to get sober implies or means that you were in this case, an alcoholic or had to be mm-hmm. an alcoholic. Mm-hmm. Right. And I don't think that's necessarily true. Mm-hmm. I think sobriety again, I, I even, I kind of tense up at that word because right. especially for my group, you gotta, you know, there's connotations to that. Right. For my group too, for every group, man, just yeah. for being a man, being a man. Yeah. But to say, I, you know, I think it takes a lot of courage just to talk about sobriety so openly and use that term itself. Yeah. I would probably myself, skirt it and call it something different. And right. even though it, it really would be the same thing, but um, because there's so many big implications to something like that. Yeah. And and that's something I had to, to swallow and say, I can skirt around all of this. And this is a conversation I had the other day with a woman who asked me, did you think you had a drinking problem? I said, no, I don't necessarily think I did have a drinking problem in itself. I had a dissociation problem. Mm -hmm. And if I take all of the ways I dissociated, so if I take pot, alcohol, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, porn, making lists for future businesses, uh, and I put them all into one substance, I was a fucking addict Mm -hmm. because I could not sit still in my own skin. I couldn't watch a movie with my wife without getting up every 10 minutes to go do something, to write something down, to grab something from the fridge, to go outside. It's just a mess. And a mess is someone who meditated. A mess is someone who taught meditation and taught mindfulness, where I knew from the collarbone up what to do and how to do it. But from the collarbone down was not living it or was, was... that was where the dissociation was. Sure. Yeah, yeah. You know, I can do it. It's like the, you know, not to pick on CrossFit, but it's a little bit bipolar. 
and that we have people that won't eat a piece of bread and will work out six days a week, but then on day seven are eating gummy bears and donuts. And, you know, and I think one of the things that attracted to me to CrossFit was that extremism Mm -hmm. is that, yeah, I want to play, I want to train so hard and push so hard. Uh, but sobriety, um, I look at it now as, you know, I actually, so let me backtrack. I said that to this woman. I said, if I take all of that stuff, Mm -hmm. you know, every way to dissociate and, and put it into a substance, then yeah, I was addicted and I wanted to get rid of that. And she said, well, 99.9% of the population does that. So you are no different than everybody else. I said, yeah, but I want to be that 0.1%. Sure. I want to, I, I want to live with presence with such intense presence and such open presence that I feel everything from this point forward because I think it's a slippery slope to get back. And then that's why, you know, coming up on a year, I had, a, you know, I, I'm not going to drink for this entire year again. People ask, will you ever drink again? I don't know, but I'm not drinking this year. Mm-hmm. I'm not dissociating this year because if it were my last year, I wouldn't want to miss a minute of it. Sure. And so why then don't we extrapolate that out? If I'm only here for 40 more years, I don't want to miss a minute of it. And I want to take the lessons from it. So this year I've gone to a bachelor party and been the odd guy out. I've gone to uh, a wedding, been the odd guy out. I've had our CPC Christmas party, which is legendary, (laughs) legendary, and sat through it, you know, while going through immense emotion, knowing it was my last one, Mm -hmm. and go, instead of looking to dissociation, I really want to look at the feelings I'm having and the process I'm going through and become fascinated by it and curious by it. So the shift went the other way. So the dissociation, and not dissociation is not the right word. The goal now is to look almost as an observer of, oh, wow, there's a guy at a Christmas party who's leaving his business in three weeks and all of these people and this wonderful community he built, and he's, he's here tonight sober. Let's watch and see what he goes through. And, and man, that's, that's hard. Yeah. That's awful. That's te- that's, you know, it's beautiful, and it's terrifying, and it's, it's, it's real. And that's why I chose, and I'll say sober, I don't give a shit what we call it at this point. It's humbled me, yeah, yeah. you know, and the first person I reached out to, um, when I decided and my initial decision to stop drinking after she left was getting divorced with alcohol as an option is going to just not be good. Right. You saw that coming. Oh yeah. The, and the, your, your ability to recognize that in that moment, like this, my understanding is this wasn't like a decision you made a week later when you're like, yeah, this could go bad. It was in that moment, that moment. Yeah. Like Whew. literally before she was out of the house, uh, I flushed all the pot I had in the house down the toilet and I took all the, she's still home and I'm, you know, she's out in the other room mm-hmm. packing. I'm pulling bottles out of, you know, our collective alcohol out and putting them outside. I'm like this can't be around me or else you just knew. I just knew. Yeah. Um, it's too easy. Even without that predilection or that history, you just knew it was the easy way out. I just knew it, man. Wow. I just knew one. I knew I was going to be alone a lot. Yeah. And what do, what do you do when you're alone? Hey, grab a couple of beers mm-hmm. Two, I was going to be in pain a lot. How do you turn do you that do? off? Yeah. Right. I just have a couple of beers and I just wanted to go the other way. Yeah. And so what's the lesson in sitting in the middle of this shit storm and how can that grow me in ways that obviously I've been holding myself back. So you've had this year, mm-hmm. quite the year, mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, a year that I think honestly, anybody wouldn't wish on anybody, mm-hmm. but I, I, I've been continually amazed by your, your ability to disassociate from your ego in it mm-hmm. and, you. and approach it from that perspective of what can I learn? Yeah. You know, you, you're a lot of times that you're looking at yourself uh, from the outside, it seems, and going, "Huh, wonder, wonder why he's doing that? Or yeah. What's what's the reason behind that? Or what's the purpose behind that? Or what's the right? What's the cause of that?" And I think that's a fantastic lesson and something I'm trying to work on as well. So, your these relationships have ended, and you found yourself with this this opportunity, right? And again, I applaud you for recognizing the opportunity and thank you and stepping out on that because you're right, you're right that most people don't recognize the opportunity when it presents itself, and yeah. then most of us don't take advantage of it. Right, and we end up in the you know what if or could have been kind of category. Mm-hmm. So you have this year over the next twenty over twenty sixteen, you're going to be blogging and you're doing video, mm-hmm. and you're going to be talking about 
kind of resolving some issues mm-hmm. and some open ended issues that have that are still out there that mm-hmm. everybody has. I can think of mm-hmm. them too. Um, and you're also going to be doing some interesting projects, yeah, that relate some directly to death, right? Right. But also, um, kind of going deeper into some of those feelings that you're having. What are some of those bigger issues you're going to be doing that you're going to be documenting? Sure, sure, sure. And if I can just jump back real quick, cause we did sure. talk about this was, and, and I'll say the quote that was said to me, uh, very quickly after my wife left, uh, I talked to a guy named Johnny King and he had gone through the same process. And he said, this was maybe like a week later. He goes, here's the deal, man. This is literally going to be either the greatest year of your life or the worst year of your life. But either way, it's going to be the hardest. So you have some decisions to make. And he said, you're probably going to tell me to go fuck myself. And I literally said, go fuck yourself. (laughs) But now that 2015 is done, I will say in hindsight, this was the best year of my life. I spent more time crying on my bathroom floor, screaming into pillows, you know, falling apart. But in hindsight, I would not trade this year for the world. So people who are going through challenges and going, I have no idea how I'm going to survive this one day at a time. You know, that's where I came up with one day stronger. Mm -hmm. Just get to the end of the day. I would not go back to where I was a year and a week ago for anything in the world because of what I've learned and because of how differently it's changed me. And what is that? Is it, is it that sense of self and, and, and purpose? It's a couple fold. It is a sense of expression for lack of a better term. I now am able to express myself through my writing, through my speaking, through working with you, Mm -hmm. through these podcasts in a way that is more authentic than I ever have before. So I had something in me that needed to come out Mm -hmm. and it couldn't come out. And so I stifled it. I shoved it down with substances and dissociation. Uh, So being able just to go, wow, this is who I am. I'm okay with it. I lost everything and found who the hell I was down in the dirt in Nicaragua. I was okay without people down there liked me without knowing who my wife was, without knowing what I did for a living. I was just this guy. And once I learned that and then started building on that of like, oh, I'm this guy that has this idea. I'm this guy that wants to help you with X. I'm this guy that can be of service in this way and with this unique way of saying it and talking about it. And then being able to do that and live it, I was like, holy shit, this is fascinating. Mm-hmm. I'm fascinating. This, this whole life thing is fascinating. God knows where it's going to go. It's open doors, open possibilities, as opposed to, I think, thinking, oh, wow, is this it, mm-hmm. where I was a year and a half ago. So what are some of those possibilities now that sure. you're going to tackle? Sure, sure, sure. So this year, some of the big things I have coming up. First is i um, going to be working in hospice, volunteering in hospice for the next three months. I leave Santa Barbara in two weeks and head to Santa Fe. And I'll literally just be volunteering with people who are dying and being of service to them in any way that they need. Uh, not doing a lot of acupuncture, even though I've offered it. It's just holding the space of saying, hey, I went through some shit and I figured out how just to breathe and say, whatever the, whatever the hell you're going through, use me. Use me even if it's just to have someone in the room. You just need another body. Mm-hmm. Tell me your story. R- let me read to you. As a family member of someone who's dying, let me relieve you. Go, go take a shower. Go run errands. I, I'm okay. I'll hold this space for you. Mm-hmm. Uh, just to be of service in that way, I'm using as a way to relearn an appreciation for life. So talking to people who are dying is a big part of this. I'm interviewing a guy this week who has uh, Lou Gehrig's. Oh. And he's 35. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, with two kids. So what can he tell me that I can pass on about the beauty of life, about the moment to moment decisions that we all can make, but may not be making because we're so caught in the loop of a job, a marriage, uh, a, a addiction, whatever it may be. Mm-hmm. So that's a biggie for the, I'll be there for three months and, and working with people that way. Wow. Three months. Yeah. And then I had, this is probably the scariest one for me personally that I've told you about. 
I will then be in, I'm heading to, to Guatemala and I'll be in complete darkness and solitude myself for 28 days. So I won't be able to see the, my hand in front of my face, zero light whatsoever for almost a month unless I freak out and tap out and have to come out. So this is like a thing you do a couple hours a day? No, it's 24 seven. You don't leave the room for a month. Someone comes and drops food through a double door, you know, clean clothes through a double door. But I will be in there in complete solitude. It's called a dark retreat. That sounds like a nightmare. <laughs> yeah. It, uh, it's so terrifying. Wait, wait, okay. Yeah. So you're in, you're in a room by yourself. Yeah. And it's dark, like pitch black. Pitch, saying. pitch black. I like can't see your hand in Zero your light. Face. Yeah. And no human interaction no human interaction no music no entertainment nothing are you allowed to leave like if can you pull like is there a yes. is there a panic yeah, button no there's just an open door i can walk through. how are you gonna find it it's pitch black in <laughs> it's not a big room <laughs> this isn't like a football field you know holy crap yeah i mean i did a isolation tank for an hour and i was like clawing my way out of it yeah how well okay I got so many questions out of sure. that. So what, cause actually you hadn't told me that. Okay. Um, what, what do you hope to learn from it or what do you expect to learn from it? Mm-hmm. And, uh, uh, why? <laughs> I don't Good know questions. why, I guess I'll just, yeah. Why? Good why? questions. Okay. Why? So I'm, I'm using the idea of death as a concept for understanding life. Sure. From my own, yeah, yeah. In my own head. This is a sense sensory death. Right, I experienced the death of my marriage, the death of my business partnership, and the death of my relationship with substances this year. So it was a big year of, let's just call it, f- virtual death. Grieving. Grieving. A lot of grieving. Yeah. A lot of grieving. And I talked to a man who did this for 49 days, and he told me about his experience. And what happens when your senses get shut off, when you can't see, when there's really nothing to hear, where you don't look at your body, where you don't speak you dive inward and you figure out who the hell you are at the deepest of levels. In addition to it being a meditative practice Uh where there is zero distraction, zero, literally there's nothing to distract you, but your own mind, your own thoughts. I can move and and work out and do yoga and meditate, et cetera. But uh, I want to know it's my version Garrett of, I fought in a cage because it was the scariest thing I could think of physically. Mm Mm-hmm. This is the scariest thing I can think of mentally and emotionally. Like, will I be okay? I don't know. Will I make it? I don't know. What happens on day 10 when you start hallucinating? I don't know. Yeah, because that's, I mean, that's coming. That's coming. There is a hallucinatory aspect to it. Uh, But then again, what are the lessons from it? What understandings can you walk out of there, come out of there with that I just don't know because it's such a foreign concept. And oh, I have yeah. no framework for it, you know, to put it around like, oh, I know how to meditate for an hour. Great. Yeah, I can turn the lights on any minute and, and go have a sandwich. You know, so this is full immersion into me, into my brain, into my emotionality, into my survival instinct, instincts, into who I am as a person. Like, let's take everything away except yeah. for my thoughts and, and what's happening below the neck what do you suspect you're going to get out of it or learn from it i suspect i will have a a sincerely different understanding of how the world works on on the deepest level and i don't like the word spiritual but my definition of spiritual is moment to moment decision that's how we relate to whatever Mm -hmm. Uh, is there a higher power i'm not sure do i believe there's something yes I don't know what it is, but I think the way to get in touch with the unknown is to remove all of the known. And so that's what I'm hoping wow. and suspect to come out of it. I like that. Say yeah. that again. How to get in touch with the unknown is to remove all of the known. Yeah. Remove all of the known. All those distractions you're talking about. Everything. All those things that you can cover things up with and pretend Absolutely that they don't bother you. Everything. You are alone with yourself. You know, and, when, you know something, ahead. sorry, this is off track, but to really just, I'm thinking about it in terms of my audience and mm-hmm. like, this is way, very specific, but work mm-hmm. and overtime and how work is easy to distract you from some of those other things that you got to deal with mm-hmm. and how, 
I know there's people out there listening who will get this and understand this, that, you know, we all have partners who work a ton of overtime mm-hmm. just so that they can be at work. So they don't have to think about it. Right. So it's easier. It's easier to be at work than it is to be at home dealing with whatever that it is they, they need to deal with. Right. Um, that's a little aside from all this, but just to relate some of that idea. I like that, that you have to strip away all the, all the knowns. Yeah. To the deep, you know, the, the most hardcore level. That is hardcore. I mean, yeah. that's, it's, it's a, it's different. It's extreme. You, and I, and I'm you're the only that. person I know who, who could succeed at that, that I know personally, like you're the only guy who I would say. I could see 30 days. He'll probably do it. Yeah. He'll probably we'll make see. it through. I would go bonkers. You may not. And and I've talked to people that have done it about how do you prep? You know, like, what the hell do I do? Do I blind myself, blindfold myself for a couple of weeks at mm-hmm. home and have something like, no, 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 there's nothing you can do to prep for it because it is such a different experience. Yeah. And what you think, how you think you'll react is, you know, if, if I just, if we just said, okay, Garrett, you got to stay in this room for the next six hours and you can't do anything. Why would you go nuts? Is because you can see a bunch of shit. You know your computer's here. You know this. So, but this, the you that's in that room is different, because the you that's in your in that room has all of those senses removed. So how you react isn't how you can react cognitively right now. So are you going to be writing? Obviously, you're not going to be writing in the dark room. But mm-hmm. I mean, you're going to write as you go. Yes. And because and you're, so, you're going to keep the blog current with your current experiences, yes. right? With the exception of the times when I'm offline, right? There's that month where I'm gone, and there's a month towards the end where it's uh, uh, another month of um, Boulder Outdoor Survival School does a 30 day intensive where you're out in the woods with about 10 guys and two coaches. Now that I want to do. Yeah, and a knife, a poncho, <laughs> and a so <laughs> water bottle. So badass. Yeah. So other than that, every week I'm doing every Monday I'm doing a year to live post, mm-hmm. and it's what I've learned that week from the conversations from the coaches. There's a lot more of, you know, there's little stuff. I've got an intense men's group this coming up this weekend, the weekend after uh, one of David data did her, his coaches is doing a weekend in Ojai. Um, just some unique sort of setups and mm-hmm. experiences and ways to grow and um, conversations. See, a lot of experiences that I think a lot of us would want to do, but may not necessarily have the opportunity to, to do ourselves. I understand. Like I, I would love to take a 30 day survivor school, but of course I am in a place where obviously I can't do that. And right. again, I applaud your ability to recognize that you are right. And to go do that. Right. If I, I, I never want to find myself in that situation where I have 30 days, frankly, to go off <laughs> because <laughs> that, that means the bad things have happened. Just absolutely. like you're saying, just yeah. like you just talked about. Yeah. I mean, at 20, that would have been fantastic. I had yeah. time. I had 30 days to go do that. I don't at 38. Right. And that's fine. I'm okay with that, but a little jealous. Uh, yeah. honestly of the of the ability to have that experience right so i think it's going to be fun to read about those experiences glean some of those lessons without having to go through it myself so that, that that really is the goal garrett because i asked a lot of people what would you do if you only had a year to live you know it's it's a question we've all gotten sure yeah and yeah we've thought about it and some people just surface answer you know, surface area answer yeah. like oh i travel that was like okay well what would you spend time with my kids yeah. Spend time, yeah what would but what would you who would you become I think is yeah. the better question than what would you do? And uh, a lot of people said, well, I can't, you know, I have, I have family. I can't do this. I'm, right. it's, and I'm not advocating. I said, I'm not advocating irresponsibility. Don't walk out on your wife and kids and go try to become a professional basketball player <laughs> at 38 with, with, you know, yeah. the, the non-biker build <laughs> as, as we've talked about. Yes. But is there a way for you to look at one of the things I'm doing and say, okay, you know what? I've always, I've always loved the guitar and I haven't played in 20 years. And even if it's once a week, how can I express that part of myself? Mm -hmm. I think I'm going to pick the thing back up again. And it could even be to bigger changes where I've literally had people I asked the question to say, I would get out of my relationship. I would quit my job. And if it's not causing harm to someone else to do that, Mm -hmm. I'll advocate for it do it. You only live once, Yeah, you know, relationships ending quickly is traumatic. Trust me. It's traumatic. Yeah. So I don't advocate that, but is there a way if your marriage isn't good, if you're, if you're constantly fighting or you're unhappy or you can't express yourself as who you really are in your marriage, then that needs to be attended to. You need to sit down with your spouse and have some hard conversations Yeah, and you should. 
because status quo it shouldn't be unhappiness shouldn't be the norm disempowerment shouldn't be the norm right uh commercialism shouldn't be the norm we shouldn't be so busy with our lives that we're not sure who the hell we are and i don't want people to have to go through what i went through which is having your whole life sort of ripped out from under you to find the answers to these questions and i'm willing to put it out there and say man i might have fucked up a couple times and I'm still going to throughout this year, but let's just put it on the table and let people use it. I love that idea too, of how you frame it of, you know, that question gets asked, like what, you know, you had a year left to live. What would you do? And a lot of it, there's a lot of uh, kind of selfish answers or kind of self, I don't say selfish, but self focused. Right. And a lot of the answers to, or the the kind of the, um, the inference in the question is often, uh, who have you become reviewing right. who you've become or looking back at who you've become. Right. And it's in, I think it's an interesting concept to take that last year and turn that question on its head to who are you going to become? Mm. Not who have you be- become, but who mm-hmm. are you going to become? Mm-hmm. And that even in your last year, there's growth potential there. Unbelievable. That, that you growth. can end uh, to, to use a cliche, but end on a high note, I guess for lack of a better term, but right you can still progress forward and move forward and leave, uh, leave in a better spot. Right. I think that's really cool. Yeah. I'm, I'm pushing for that and want people that are following along to use the trip too, to use my experiences for their own Yeah. and say, okay, maybe I can't go 30 days and do this. I can't walk away from my life, but what can I learn from what he's mm-hmm. doing and how can I apply it? You know, people are, are dying for purpose for oh, something yeah. other than oh, yeah. my paycheck, the shitty vacation I take two weeks every year, the first week of which is just recovery because I hate my job, the second week of which is anxiety because right. I have to go back to it. It's like we talked the last episode, psychological salary. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Heal your lives. Yeah. And that's, I'm pushing for that. Yeah. Of please heal your lives. Please heal what is dissociated in you. You know, what would happen to you? You know, we. I know you're in law enforcement and a lot of these listeners are in law enforcement. But a question I always like to ask people who were vehemently anti-drug is what would happen in the U.S. if all of the drugs went away in a day? Who, how many people are propping themselves up with alcohol, marijuana, cocaine, whatever, even if there's negative side effects? How many people, if, if everything was stripped away and they had to just be with themselves, would go ballistic? And so let's heal those part of our lives. Yeah. You know, why do we keep going back to, well, I've quit drinking six times, even if it's only a six pack a week. Right. What is it about yourself that's not okay without that? And with all of these little distractions. Yeah. Big questions. It's a big question. So people uh, will obviously infer, or I'll be explicit if they haven't inferred that you're going to be gone for quite some time. Yeah. And a lot of, amazing things to come of it and i'm mm-hmm. excited i'm super excited for you man and, thank you uh you can already go to traverbohm.com that's b-o-e-h-m well traver too t-r-a-v-e-r <laughs> b-o-e-h-m and uh check that out we'll also have a link in the show notes um to read some of the stuff you've already posted which mm-hmm. is good stuff heavy stuff but really good powerful stuff thank you and um so you're gonna be uh uh, on hiatus, we'll say, yeah, from participating in the Squadron podcast, yeah, uh, directly anyway, yeah. Um, uh, as we mentioned before, we have uh, we both have different projects we're working on this year. Some are together, so mm-hmm. um, you'll be around, yeah, at times, but yeah. you'll be you won't be on mic, put it that way, because you're going to be off doing these other cool things, yeah. Um, so this is a finale episode of sorts. For you. <laughs> we said after school special, so we yeah, have to have yeah, a yeah. finale. Um. So, you know, thank you for the effort and time you've put in thank the, you. this so far. Um, it's been an incredible experience to have you here. Um, sh- I, I, sh- I don't know if I've told a story on, on air, so to speak, before, but you know, I came to you with this idea for the show Yeah, about a week after all this happened in, in that January, right? right. After, your week, after your wife left. Yeah, I think you were there the week after she left. Yeah, and I didn't know. I didn't right. know that at the time. And I, I kind of ran this by you and told you my big idea. Yeah. <clears throat> and I explained something that I believe now even more than when when I said it to you, 
Um, but it's just over the last year been reaffirmed to me, especially with the idea that you've started this project with these such, with such big ideas that, you know, I told you in your office, like, I want you on this, on this project because you're bigger than a coach. Mm, you know, you're bigger than a gym owner. Yeah. And, uh, you've got a bigger purpose in this world than just being, uh, just being a gym owner. There's bigger things that you need to tell people. Mm -hmm. And I want to give you uh, an opportunity to do that. Yeah. On the show. And, um, I had no idea that you were thinking that exact same thing at that same time that you had this burning desire to get out and do something bigger, but you weren't, you, you had this, all this other stuff falling down on you at the same time. And you were kind of struggling to get just out of the rubble of that Yeah, at that moment. And, um, that conversation had a positive effect on, on you. 100%. And, uh, I was, I was doing, I don't know what workout I was doing, but came out in the, you came out of your office in the middle because I, we, we met and then I went and did my workout or whatever. And you yeah. came out of your office in the middle and gave me a big hug. Yeah. Uh, and I could tell something was really, really, uh, devastating to you that was going on. Yeah. Uh, and you later filled me in on it a couple weeks later. Yeah. So to, to see where you started a year ago at that, at that a point, which is lower than anyone else, mm-hmm. anyone ever wants to be. Mm-hmm. And to grieve these losses of your marriage and your friendship, well, not your friendship, but your business relationship with Eric mm-hmm. and the gym and losing that identity as a, as a coach or as a, as a gym owner, mm-hmm. but also putting yourself out there with the identity that is more yourself, more true to you, right. Of writer and speaker mm-hmm. and uh, teacher, I think is just, is is a phenomenal to watch but also inspiring and um very much a role model for for just putting yourself out there and that showing your vulnerability is is going to be the thing that connects people to you and helps people learn better things thank you so um no thank you it's been it's been an amazing uh adventure of of uh fun and knowledge and also just being able to see someone who's got a much better grasp of their own capabilities and a much better grasp of their own weaknesses Mm. than I do and taking a little bit of that and being able to, well, if Traver can think about these things in a distract, not a distracted in a disassociated way to really evaluate his his intents and purposes and meanings and why can't I, mm-hmm. why well, can mm-hmm. so let's do that. Yeah. And I've learned a lot this last year as a result of that. Beautiful. And I look forward to learning more in 2016 as I read your blog and follow your videos. And Thank I encourage you. everybody to do this as well, to do that and follow and like your Facebook, uh, Facebook page is just you, right? Yep. Is Traver you? Bohm and, um, Twitter, Yep. For the at, project. At Traver Bohm. And Instagram. At Traver Bohm. Pretty simple, right? Yep. You can find everything there. Yeah. And the hashtag for uh, Instagram is year to live project. Awesome. Yeah. So, uh, best of luck, man. I know it's going to be fantastic. You. Thank you. I'm a little scared of that Guatemala <laughs> thing still. <laughs> Me too, man. <laughs> not not going to lie. <laughs> it may turn into three days in the darkness and 27 <laughs> days on the beach and I'll just have a really creative write up about how awful it was. There you go be tan on the last day (laughs) wait a minute (laughs) and you leave next week i leave in two weeks from today okay so by the time this is up you will be on the road to santa fe yeah take care buddy thank you so much have fun and it's going to be an experience but i I can't wait to see you back on the other side of it sometime and give you a big hug yeah me too all right so to follow traver it's uh, at traver bohm t-r-a-v-e-r-b-o-e-h-m on instagram twitter and facebook our uh show notes for this will be on the squadroom.net forward slash episode 22 head there for the show notes and links on all that sort of stuff uh you can also text the squad room the squad room all one word to 44222 to sign up for a mailing list please consider review, leaving a review on itunes as well that really helps out the show and again i want to thank the uh guys at sb tactical and i combat training system for their support of the show Check them out at sbtactical.com and watch the video of their active shooter training system in action. It's replication, not simulation. Until next time, take care of each other and please stay safe.